What happens here isn't magic. It just feels that way. Because there's no telling what will occur when people unsatisfied with the way things are have the courage to imagine a better way and the freedom to turn what could be into what will. That takes bold thinking, disruptive ideas, and an amazing array of perspectives, people, and intellectual pursuits. But it's hard to capture something that won't stand still. Try to pin this place down with a label, and you'll only box it in. That's Berkeley. Berkeley. This is a place built by the people, for the people, founded and forever inspired by those who had an unstoppable drive to build a new state on the western edge. We embraced the radical idea of a public university and never looked back, forging new paths to knowledge, insight, and opportunity. Hundreds of thousands of lives changed for people who then go out and change the lives of millions more in our state our nation, and the world. That's Berkeley. Berkeley. Doing what the world needs most is what drives us. A revolutionary treatment for malaria? Check. Unlocking the secrets of the universe? Been there. Preserving Mark Twain for posterity? Done that. Taking on today's biggest challenges? We're always one step ahead. And sometimes, that step is too big for words alone to describe. We express. We interpret. We reach further. We celebrate. We excel. And we are celebrated for our excellence. But we are driven not by fame, prize money, or bragging rights but by a deep desire to solve, to innovate, to surpass, to do better, to do good. You'll find us in an urban classroom, an impoverished village in Africa, within the smallest unit of matter, across the universe. That's Berkeley. Berkeley. This is more than a place. Berkeley is big ideas, big ambitions, big spirit. Berkeley is a long tradition of untraditional excellence. Berkeley is where conventional wisdom comes to die. Life shaping, world changing, future building. Right here, right now, at Berkeley. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, and welcome to the University of California, Berkeley, for this historic day. I'm Jefferson Coombs, the Executive Director of Berkeley's Cal Alumni Association, and I am honored to be with you today as your MC for this historic event. On behalf of Berkeley's 474,000 alumni living around the world, and on behalf of all the classes that have graduated from Cal since 1872, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's proceedings the inauguration of Nicholas Dirks as 10th Chancellor of the University of California, Berkeley. Before we get started with this afternoon's program, I would like to go through some of our house rules with you. In the spirit of community, we ask that all be respectful of our fellow audience members at this time, I would like to request that everyone please turn off your cellular mobile telephone. I would like to request that all electronic devices which emit any sound please be turned off at this time. 
Flash photography will be allowed during the applause sections of today's programs, but please, no flash photography during presentations by our speakers. Additionally, we would like to ask that everybody remain seated while the program continues. And finally, there will be no banners or posters to be displayed during today's ceremony. Any banners or posters that are displayed will be removed from the auditorium, and we thank you for your understanding. Academic convocations, such as inaugurations and commencements, are structured in accordance to age-old culture and traditions and history. And today's procession will feature five separate groups that embody our culture and our history here at the University of California, Berkeley. The procession will include our alumni, staff, faculty, visiting sister delegate institutions, and the official inaugural party. In hopes of adding to your pleasure and understanding of the ceremony, I will give you a brief explanation of each procession as it enters Zellerbach Auditorium. First will be the entry of the classes. This is the procession that symbolizes the loyalty and the love that Berkeley alumni have for our alma mater. The classes will march in chronological order, each accompanied by a member of the student body serving as an honor escort bearing the individual banner designed by that class at the time of their graduation. Leading the procession for alumni is Cynthia So Schroeder, president of the Cal Alumni Association, and Harry Legrand, Berkeley's vice chancellor for student affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce the traditional parade of classes. to introduce the second procession to enter the auditorium. This is the staff of the Berkeley campus. 
Every university is composed of a balance between academic and non-academic personnel. The Berkeley campus depends on its non-academic staff to ensure the daily operations of our vast enterprise. John Wilton, Vice Chancellor of Business and Administrative Services, and Gabor Basri, Vice Chancellor of Equity and Inclusion, will lead the procession of Berkeley staff. Ladies and gentlemen, the staff procession. Ladies and gentlemen, our next procession is the academic procession and will be led by George Breslauer, Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost at Berkeley, and Elizabeth Deacon, Chair of the Berkeley Division of the Academic Senate. Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost Breslauer is carrying the Berkeley Mace, a symbol of authority made from the original timber of Old South Hall originally constructed on the Berkeley campus in 1873. It is the oldest building on the Berkeley campus and indeed the oldest building in the entire University of California system. Following the marshals come representatives of the faculty and academic staff of the Berkeley campus. They will be in academic regalia. The velvet facing and velvet bars on sleeves are the insignia of the traditional doctoral gown. The hood draped behind represents both the field of study and the institution which conferred the degree. A hood with a dark blue velvet border represents philosophy. A green border represents medicine. A white border represents the, the letters and arts, and other colors represent other disciplines. The lining of the hood indicates the institution which conferred the degree. A University of California hood has a gold satin lining with one blue chevron. Regalia which vary from this pattern normally represent universities from other countries. Ladies and gentlemen, the academic procession. The next procession are delegates from visiting sister institutions of higher learning, 
representing universities from across the state of California and indeed from around the world. These delegates will march in the order of the date when their respective institutions were founded, from the oldest to the newest. Today we are honored to have representation from Cambridge University, which was founded in 1209 AD. This procession is being led by Mary Gilley, Vice Chair, University-wide Academic Senate, and Graham Fleming, Berkeley's Vice Chancellor for Research. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce the final delegation in today's procession, the official inaugural party. The inaugural party will be led by William Jacob, chair of the university-wide academic senate at Berkeley. The official party will process in the following order, former and current University of California chancellors appointed University of California Regents, our honored speakers, the chair of the UC Board of Regents, the president of the University of California, and Berkeley's Chancellor, Nicholas B. Dirks. Ladies and gentlemen, the official party.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Keith Watts, Cal's class of 2014, who will sing the Star Spangled Banner. Please rise. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight, o'er oh, the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er oh, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you very much, Keith. That was wonderful. I am now honored and pleased to introduce the 20th president of the University of California, Janet Napolitano. Ladies and gentlemen, Berkeley is proud of its culture and history of free speech, and we ask that you all honor that opportunity today and honor the president of the University of California and respect the meaning of free speech for all. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and welcome to everyone here, because it is a great pleasure to celebrate the investiture of Nicholas B. Dirks as the 10th Chancellor of the University of California at Berkeley. <laughs> Chancellor Dirks is an eminent scholar. He's an engaging humanist. And as I have learned, he is a tenacious leader. He is the right leader for this campus at this time, and we should all give him our fullest support. UC Berkeley is a public treasure by virtue of its elite academics as well as its public service mission. When John F. Kennedy spoke before the UC Berkeley community in 1962, he said, and I quote, 
This college, from its earliest beginnings, has recognized, and its graduates have recognized, that the purpose of education is not merely to advance the economic self-interest of its graduates. The people of California, as much if not more than the people of any other state, have supported their colleges and their universities and their schools because they recognize how important it is the maintenance of a free society that its, its citizens be well educated. <laughs> Chancellor Dirks is committed, deeply committed, to what stands behind Kennedy's words. He's committed to the diversity, the complexity, the academic excellence, and the public service mission that constitute this great institution. Chancellor Dirks, I look forward to working with you. Congratulations, Fiat Lux, and go Bears. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Perez, Speaker of the California State Assembly and ex officio UC Regent. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be part of the ceremony and to help carry on the proud traditions of UC Berkeley. Before I begin, I do want to take a moment to thank J.K. Rawlings for furnishing the wardrobe for today. I've actually always found the idea of academic regalia to be a little confusing. Nowhere else would stature be demonstrated by being in a robe at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> As Speaker of the Assembly and Regent of the University of California, I'm pleased to take part in the inauguration of Chancellor Nicholas Dirks. Chancellor Dirks is the 10th Chancellor of UC Berkeley since the position was created in 1952. By point of contrast, there have been 10 speakers of the assembly in the last 20 years, which really illustrates that those with political survival skills aren't found in politics, but in academia. <laughs> the ceremony we're engaged in today is part of UC Berkeley's rich, varied, and celebrated history. UC Berkeley, the home of the physicists who identified new elements, paleontologists who discovered prehistoric sites, the faculty who fought for shared governance, and students who fought for free speech. Berkeley, the home of the pioneering center for labor research and education, a vital tool for advancing just wages and working conditions for California's workers, the backbone of our economy. <laughs> Berkeley, the proud home of 22 Nobel laureates, a US poet a U.S. Poet Laureate, and more than 3,500 Peace Corps volunteers. But UC Berkeley has never rested on its laurels or its laureates. Every day the research goes on, the activism continues, and the advances stack up. And every student who walks through Sather Gate has the opportunity to become another Steve Wozniak another Earl Warren or Joan Didion. Or better yet, every student here has the opportunity to make a name for themselves by using the talent and intellect that UC Berkeley hones to make discoveries and explore pursuits we can't even begin to fathom. As speaker and as regent, I have a unique privilege to help fulfill the mission of this university to succeed as a public university, providing accessible, affordable, high-quality education. Yes. You see, the state of California and the University of California are both coming out of the fiscal and programmatic difficulties caused by the Great Recession. And yes, there is still need for continued prudence, but there's also a need to look at reinvesting and reinvigorating our mission. It's time to make sure that this world-class university still attracts talented students from not only across the great tapestry of California, but across the globe. And those students and their families shouldn't have to take on a mountain of debt to obtain a degree. I had a chance to sit 
and spent time with Chancellor Dirks when he first came to the Capitol in June and again since then. And my colleagues and I are really looking forward to our continued work with him over the next several years. Now, the Chancellor has written several books on the British Raj system, so he should be well prepared to deal with my colleagues on the Board of Regents. <laughs> His time spent at Caltech will probably help Chancellor Dirks appreciate the physics-defying Rube Goldbergian uh, nature of education policy and finance in California. And yes, that's Rube Goldberg, engineering, UC Berkeley, class of 1904. There are 10 campuses in the UC system, and they all know that Berkeley is my favorite. <laughs> if the other chancellors speak to each other, they'll note that I offer them all to be my second favorite. <laughs> but uh, Berkeley is the flagship of our system, and it is a place that had a tremendous impact on my life. So this institution has a very special place in my heart. It has a special place in the history and more importantly the future of the state of California. The first chancellor of this great institution, Clark Kerr, once said that he believed that the knowledge industry had the power to be as transformative for America as the railroad industry and the automobile industry. And that's certainly true. And I believe that UC Berkeley is the global headquarters of the knowledge industry. What is also true is that 53 years ago, the state legislature in the three segments of the state system of higher education entered into a great compact with the people of California, the master plan of higher education. More than a concept or a plan, it was a promise. A promise of access, a promise of affordability, and a promise of opportunity. With the eyes of the world always looking to Berkeley, this campus has the responsibility to constantly and consistently demonstrate the leadership that ensures this promise is kept. Chancellor Dirks, with your inauguration today, you commit yourself to the stewardship of one of the finest public institutions in the world. With your inauguration, you commit yourself to the success of every student on this campus and to the professional growth and economic security of the university's faculty and staff. With your inauguration today, you commit yourself to fight for justice for working people, and this university must set the example of respect and demonstrate to young people that hard-earned wages should always be enough to support a family. Let me be clear. The University of California cannot fulfill its mission and remain a world-class institution unless it treats all its employees equally and equitably and treats them with the same tender care that we treat our students. <laughs> Chancellor Dirks, with your inauguration today, you commit yourself to maintaining a diverse and dynamic campus that is safe and welcoming for all. With your inauguration, you commit yourself to working tirelessly to ensure that this university will remain accessible, affordable, and academically second to none. With your inauguration, you assume the mantle of leadership to keep the promise that California made 53 years ago. The mantle of leadership to fulfill that promise is the University of California, Berkeley itself. The mantle of leadership to help ensure that the entire UC moves in the right and just direction in all its endeavors. Chancellor Dirks, please know that as long as this university remains dedicated to serving the students it was created to serve, my door and the door of all my colleagues will always remain open to your administration. So in closing, I'd like to just offer my congratulations to you, Chancellor Dirks, and to say, go Bears. Thank you, Speaker. And now, please join me in welcoming Bruce Varner, Chair of the University of California Board of Regents.
Thank you, and, and good afternoon. After listening to the speaker, I must comment, I'm a UC Santa Barbara graduate, and it, <laughs> it's one of my favorite campuses, but over the years, I really come to love Berkeley, so we, this is one of my favorite places, so <laughs> glad to be here. <clears throat> As, as chairman of the Board of Regents, it is my great honor to be here today to witness the inauguration of Nicholas B. Dirks as the 10th, 10th Chancellor of the University of California at Berkeley. And as you've heard, of course, this is a day for celebrating, for honoring traditions, and for uniting as a community to mark this new chapter in Cal's prestigious history. I think you all agree that Berkeley is indeed a university like no other. And of course, this is the University of California's flagship campus where the California dream of creating a world-class public research university first took root. And it's just a pleasure for us to be part of this. From the very beginning as a land-grant university, Berkeley has led the way in research, creating new knowledge in every field from the arts and humanities to technology and the sciences. And as we all know, Cal has recognized the world over for its scholarship and its innovation, second to none. I was a member of the search committee that recommended Nicholas Dirks, and we were well aware of the unique combination of qualities required for the services that UC Berkeley so richly deserves. And I'm confident we found the perfect match in, in Nicholas. Your new chancellor is a scholar, a forward-thinking academic, administrator, and a strong advocate for students. He understands the importance of preserving the public nature of this university the strong traditions of free speech, tolerance, and social justice that Berkeley is famous for. And he shares the Berkeley values that make this campus such a special place to work and study. Inclusiveness, diversity, and commitments to excellence and accessibility. On behalf of the Regents of the University of California, I want to congratulate Chancellor Dirks. You have our support and appreciation and our absolute commitment to work with you as you lead Berkeley forward to even greater achievements. Our congratulations and thank you all. Thank you, Regent Varner. And now delivering greetings on behalf of the Berkeley faculty is Elizabeth Deacon, Chair of the Berkeley Academic Senate. On behalf of the Berkeley Division of the Academic Senate, I congratulate Nicholas Dirks on his inauguration as the 10th Chancellor of the Berkeley campus. The faculty welcomes this accomplished scholar and administrative leader, and we are committed to working with him to secure a bright future for Berkeley. The University of California's status as a public trust and its tradition of the faculty's critical engagement in the operation and management of the university have helped to create a university of international renown. For nearly 100 years, since the 1920 agreement establishing shared governance at the University of California, Berkeley faculty have worked together with the administration to create a university of exceptional distinction, one that is a major asset to the state of California. The ongoing exchange of ideas between faculty and administration has been a source of creativity and innovation at Berkeley. We look forward to working with Nick Dirks to preserve this tradition of shared governance, to strengthen Berkeley's high standards of excellence in teaching, research, and public service, and to maintain and enhance our campus's hard-earned and well-deserved reputation as the greatest public university in the US and perhaps the world. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Lee Bollinger, President of Columbia University. I am deeply honored to be invited to speak today on this historic occasion. At the inauguration of your new chancellor, who also happens to be my colleague and friend, Nicholas B. Dirks. I confess to being confused about the identity I bring to this glorious ceremony. <laughs> my relationships with Berkeley are multiple and emotionally complex. I was born and raised close by, so Berkeley has always seemed like my home institution. Our son and oldest child came here for a splendid undergraduate education. So my wife Jean and I are proud parents. Some of my closest friends in life have been on this faculty. Once you bestowed upon me your Clark Kerr Award, an honor I value more than any other. Moving to the institutional level, I have always believed and said so publicly on many occasions that for pure academic quality, there is no university deserving of more esteem than Berkeley. As a longtime faculty member and then president of the University of Michigan, I believe deeply in the virtues of our great public institutions and of the nation's unique and mutually beneficial dual system of public and private universities. And for many reasons, going deep into intellectual character and activism, there is a special kinship between Berkeley and Columbia University, my wonderful and last academic home. As I stand here this afternoon, therefore, I feel many parts of me vying for attention. But there is one thing, and it's by far the most important, about which I am not in the least bit confused. And that is the rightness of Nick Dirks to lead this illustrious university at this time. In him is everything you need for this role and for this moment. He's from here. He understands the values and virtues of publicness. He is himself a scholar of the first order and therefore will not abide mediocrity. He knows the elements and the ingredients of the finest teaching. He has firsthand experience with the labyrinthine ways of the academy. He is objective enough to know our limitations, our peculiarities, while still loving us for who we are. And above all, he cares and wants more than anything in life to take on the high responsibilities and burdens of this noble mission. I have one final comment on why Nick is right for Berkeley and Berkeley is right for Nick. I believe and I think Nick believes that we are in, are in an era when the greatest challenge we have, and it's the best of all challenges to have, is to figure out what knowledge we should be seeking, what ideas we should be pursuing, what questions we should be answering, and how we should organize ourselves in that quest and what alignment we should have with the broader world. This is not a time for maintenance and general upkeep of just keeping things in order. It is a time for focusing on the fundamentals of academic work. This is for many reasons. The world around us is changing in extraordinary ways. With the rise of a global economic system the introduction of the first ever truly global communication technology, and the inexorable emergence of perplexing global issues requiring new understandings, new institutions of governance, and participants who do not see everything as a zero-sum game. There are new and extremely promising areas of science and engineering, the mind, brain, vast data, and many others, and there most certainly is the need to nurture disciplines and fields that in the end always teach us the most 
about what we really care about the most in life, namely the humanities and the arts. Nick Dirks knows all these things. <laughs> Nick Dirks knows all these things. He has studied and written on them, he has labored on them, and he has, above all, lived them. It will therefore be a very special joy for all of us who care so much about this very great university to watch what you do together in the years ahead with your new chancellor at the helm, whom you too will come to respect, believe in, and regard as a friend. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Bollinger. And now delivering greetings from the staff is Sarah Thacker, director and ombudsperson. I am honored to stand before you to extend a warm welcome from the staff of the University of California, Berkeley. We celebrate with you, Chancellor Dirks, this historic occasion of your inauguration as the 10th chancellor of our great university. In speaking with Chancellor Dirks, it is clear that he recognizes that the greatness of our institution comes not just from the contributions of faculty and students, but also from staff, who he describes as the unsung heroes, the unsung heroes of our university. It is staff who keep Cal running, from the gardeners who tend to the 1,232 acres of our campus, to the electricians who keep the lights on and the generators functioning. <laughs> from, the, yes. from the grants and administrators who ensure that innovative scientific research is funded, to the financial analysts who keep the bills paid. From the admissions officers who read more than 67,000 applications each year to select the finest freshman class to the financial aid officers and student advisors who ensure that students receive the support they need. It is staff, it is staff who make sure that our computers and websites function, that students are housed and fed, and that classes are scheduled and laboratories are running. And it is these contributions, as well as countless others, that support Berkeley's continued ranking as the premier public institution of higher education. Chancellor Dirks, the staff not only welcome you and your family, especially your wife, Professor Janaki Bakli, but stand ready to support you with its talents, hard work, and unwavering commitment to ensuring the continued greatness of our university. Congratulations, Chancellor Dirks, and go Bears. Please now welcome students of the University of California, Berkeley, who will deliver greetings to our new chancellor from our students. Welcome. Hello everyone, my name is DJ Papito and I am the ASUC student body president here. <laughs> Thanks to Chancellor Dirks, students have a bright future ahead of them, as student concerns and issues are truly heard at an elevated level. My name is Ross Crockett and I am the chairman of the University of California Rally Committee. I would like to thank Chancellor Dirks for engaging with the students to preserve the University of California's spirit and tradition of non-traditional excellence. Hi, my name is Brogan Dyer. I'm the Panhellenic Executive Council President. Thanks to Chan Chancellor Dirks, the fraternity and sorority community have the renewed energy to develop their leadership potential. Good afternoon, I'm Bahar Nawab, Vice President for the Graduate Assembly, Berkeley's Graduate Student Government. 
I thank Chancellor Dirks for valuing undergraduate and graduate student leaders and for partnering with our student governments to improve the student experience at Cal. Hi everyone, my name is Brandon Hagee. I'm in the Haas School of Business. I'm a senior and a member of the men's golf team. I just want to say it's an unbelievable honor to be here today, just hearing everyone speak. Um, thanks to Chancellor Dirks, uh, Cal will continue to foster the combination of elite academic achievement alongside superior athletic performance. As a senior, I am proud, appreciative, and thankful for having the opportunity to excel at both parts of the phrase student athlete here at one of the finest universities in the world. Thank you. Our exceptional Berkeley students. So now is a very special moment. And once again, I am honored to bring back and welcome back President Janet Napolitano, who will now perform the ceremony of investiture. At this time, I would like to invite Chancellor Dirks to the stage for the formal ceremony of investiture. He will be accompanied by Chancellor Emeritus Robert Bergenau of Berkeley and President Lee Bollinger of Columbia University. Chancellor Dirks will be removing his hood from the University of Chicago, where he received his PhD in history in 1981 and donning the University of California, Berkeley hood. In a moment, I will also present Chancellor Dirks with the Chancellor's Medal. Berkeley's Chancellor's Medal was first given to Clark Kerr when he became the first Chancellor in 1952. The medal is passed from Chancellor to Chancellor and inscribed with their years of service. And now, are you ready? <laughs> Please let me quote from the standing order of the Regents. The chancellor of each campus shall be the executive head of all activities on the campus. The chancellor shall be responsible for its organization and operation. And the chancellor's decisions made in accordance with the policies established by the board or the president of the university shall be final. So be it known that I, Janet Napolitano, president of the University of California, on this eighth day of November, 2013, acting for the Regents of the University of California and on behalf of the faculty, staff, and students, do hereby install Nicholas B. Dirks as the Chancellor of the University of California, Berkeley, and vest in him all the authority and rights appertaining thereto. Chancellor Dirks, as tangible evidence of your office, I will now present you with the Chancellor's Medal.
Thank you. Thank you so much. On November 8, 2012, then-President Mark Udoff announced my selection as the 10th Chancellor of the University of California at Berkeley. Today, exactly one year later, I take on the mantle of Chancellor in the traditional ceremony of investiture. I thank the President, the members of the search committee, and the regents of the University of California for their confidence in me. It is now my great privilege and honor to accept this high responsibility and to pledge my service to one of the greatest institutions of higher education and the finest public research university in the world today. I am joined in today's inauguration ceremony by our new University of California president, Janet Napolitano, by representatives of the regents, of the faculty, staff, students, and alumni of UC Berkeley. I am joined as well by visiting dignitaries of the state of California and distinguished delegates from our many sister institutions across the state and the country and beyond, who have come to extend their good wishes to me and to express their regard for this great university. I thank you all for your presence here today and for your warm support. I've been sustained in my life journey by love and support of family. I'm especially proud and grateful to share this special day with my colleague and my wife, Janaki Buckley, who moved with me here who consented to move with me here to Berkeley <laughs> to take up a position as professor in the departments of history and South and Southeast Asian studies. I'm so pleased to be surrounded by family. Our son, Ishan, my daughter, Sandhya, my mother, my brothers and sister, my mother-in-law, brother-in-law, and other close family members. My father, who was a professor of religious studies at Yale and for most of the 1970s, vice chancellor of the humanities at UC Santa Cruz, and my father-in-law, who passed away earlier this year, are here with us in spirit. Ceremonial occasions mark transitions and launch new beginnings, even as they afford an opportunity to reflect on our history and pay tribute to the noble association of men and women, past and present, who believed in this extraordinary idea and created and led this great university. I'd like especially to recognize and thank two of my predecessors who are here with us today, Chancellors Emeriti Robert Burdall and Robert Bergenau. They did so much to sustain the reality of access and excellence at Berkeley over the past 15 years during very hard times indeed. Now, although I've made my journey here to Berkeley late in life, after a career spent in institutions across the country and scholarship around the world, I have never felt more at home. In the goals I propose for my time here, I'll seek to connect the many strands of my own upbringing, experience, and belief to the deepest and most resolute commitments of this great institution. I grew up in a household where universities were never far away, and yet with the keen awareness that for my father, the university was always a strange and wondrous thing. He had grown up on a farm in Iowa and only learned English in a one-room schoolhouse in the prairie. He went to college because his damaged heart could not sustain the physical labor of the farm, and only went on from a local college to Columbia for his PhD because of the accidental awakening of his intellect in Dubuque, Iowa. <laughs> Yet, and he went on from there to Columbia and several other institutions and spent many years at Yale, and he had very many happy years at Yale, but he found his highest institutional calling at one of the other campuses of the University of California. 
Now, he had previously taken me and my family to India when I was just 12 in another journey that changed my life opening up my early sense of the vastness and difference of the world, creating an intellectual, cultural, and yes, personal counterpoint for my life ever since. When I was young, he took me to the Yale Library to do research on term papers, but he also took me to the Yale Chapel to hear William Sloan Coffin recount the travails and struggles of Selma, Alabama, or preach about Martin Luther King's strategy of civil disobedience. I was fortunate later to have an extraordinary undergraduate education at Wesleyan University, where I took advantage of a deep institutional commitment to the liberal arts and interdisciplinary studies, while also receiving support to return to India while an undergraduate to do advanced research. Later, as a graduate student in Chicago, I continued to study across a wide range of disciplines while engaging India much more profoundly, emerging as unsure of my own true discipline as I was certain that I wanted to create similar interdisciplinary opportunities for other students. I went on from Chicago to Caltech, then to the University of Michigan and then Columbia, all institutions that have expanded my own intellectual horizons far more than I did theirs, all the while cementing my belief in the paramount importance of the university for our society as well as for ourselves. I stand before you now as Chancellor of the University of California at Berkeley with great humility, but also with confident conviction that we combine the best of those institutions while affording even greater access to a more diverse group of students, faculty, and staff, and providing even more in the way of a commitment to a public mission than any other university in the world. Our excellence, our vitality, and our value endure as a direct consequence of these attributes, not despite them. I am determined that this will always be so. Now today, as the nation and our state emerge from years of financial calamity, from a time that has witnessed a massive and unprecedented level of disinvestment in public higher education, it is clear that Berkeley has man managed to do far more than simply weather the storm. Given all we have been through, it is tempting simply to celebrate our survival and carry on as we always have. Yet as I've heard in countless conversations over the past months with members of our community, students, faculty, staff, and alumni, there is a palpable commitment to doing more, not just to follow our time-honored predispositions to challenge the status quo, reject conventional thinking, but to build on our past by reimagining the future. I'm convinced that together we can and must take advantage of an unparalleled moment of possibility for public higher education and for this institution in particular. I believe that Berkeley is positioned not just to counter skepticism, but to rebuild public faith in the very value of education. As we confront the most complex and daunting global challenges, we have the opportunity to re-envision the American Research University as a public enterprise, by which I mean on the foundation of time-tested values and a deep belief that our individual fates as Californians, Americans, and global citizens are inextricably bound together. None of us can do this alone. It is imperative that we marshal all of our resources and address all of our constituencies in government and outside to reinvigorate the ties that bind us to the public we serve. And we must do this by reinvoking the utopian ideals that have animated the entire history of this great institution. I begin today by refusing to frame the paramount challenges before us in what have become normative terms. I resist the stark divide between teaching and research, between general and professional education, between basic and applied research, between the arts and the sciences, between private interest and public good, between our local obligations and our global ambitions, between disciplinary specialization and multidisciplinary collaboration, between our commitment to diversity and to intellectual excellence, between the goals of a college 
and the aspirations of a university. I believe that the American university became as successful as it did precisely because it combined these features rather than sealing them off from each other. I hold that the kinds of intellectual and moral challenges that are part of the undergraduate education in the liberal arts and sciences are critical to the very formulation and defense of the idea of the university. I hold that the role of the faculty in shared governance here at Berkeley provides a model for all of higher education at a time when the university as a viable institution for the future is so seriously being questioned. I hold that the university serves a public mission and that the education we provide is a public good. I hold that the research we do not only makes for better products, medicines, technologies, and policies, but also for a better education for a broader public. And I hold that a great public institution both provides leadership in confronting our greatest challenges and produces leaders who will most successfully address them in the years ahead. I hold that the university serves its immediate public best by acknowledging we not only provide a global model, but the most successful example of a genuinely global institution. And I hold that these core commitments in fact provide the most secure ground on which we as a university, as a society, and as individuals can respond to the prevailing loss of public confidence in the basic value of education and the efficacy of public endeavors. It is from this space we can and we will lead this campus to a new era of promise and possibility. Now, in order to re-envision the future for a great public research university, I believe that we must expand and revise our understanding of each of Berkeley's primary mission elements, teaching, research, and public service. In each area, I've identified the need for a comprehensive initiative, to, together forming a set of three interconnected pillars upon which we can build during my first years as chancellor. They are undergraduate education, the global university, and innovation in basic and applied research across the disciplines. I'll describe these initiatives as pillars precisely to support our public calling and our enduring commitment to change the world. First, however, since I am, at the end of the day, a scholar of the past, I need to set all of this in the context of the history and traditions of this extraordinary institution. I follow a long line of leaders who never lost faith in the bold vision that created the University of California 145 years ago. It was to be a complete university, combining the dream of a New England college transplanted in the West with the idea that this new Western university had to be oriented towards practical pursuits and science as well as moral education. The new university's first inaugural address was given by Daniel Coit Gilman in 1872 who reaffirmed Abraham Lincoln's sentiments in tribute to the Morrill Act to say it is of the people and for the people. He went on to say not in any low or unworthy sense, but in the highest and noblest relations to their intellectual and moral well-being. The rich traditions of the East were blended with the expansive vigor and true grit of the West as Yale Blue was joined to California Gold. The university became an exceptional center of learning, quickly recognized for its academic excellence as a peer of the great universities of the East. From 1870, only two years after the opening of our doors, women were included in the student body, as were an increasing number of students from foreign lands. A city of intellect took shape on this hill with the Greek Theater, Bolt Hall, Doe Library, the Campanile, and Sailor Gate, constructed with the help of local benefactors who sought to ensure the monumental durability of this great idea. By 1910, the university was well known for cultivating mechanics and metaphysics with equal success. 
By 1934, the American Council of Education found that the University of California had as many distinguished graduate departments as any other university in the nation. And that hasn't changed. In the years after World War II, the university propelled the growth of Northern California as one of the most important centers of innovation, discovery, and economic growth for the nation. And at this propitious moment, the university named as chancellor one of the nation's greatest leaders of higher education, Clark Kerr. Clark Kerr was the first to identify what he called the multiversity in his extraordinary Godkin lectures of 1963, and to expound within it a vision of universal access and commitment to the fullest possible realization of individual talent. His master plan for higher education, already referred to by Speaker Perez, was adopted in 1960, and it was the greatest organizational idea for public higher education in the 20th century. The plan legitimated the concentration of research and high-performing students in its flagship institution while making the system of education from community colleges across the state to the Berkeley campus, that was by then Harvard's peer, integrated in an unprecedented way an institutional reflection of American democratic ideals joined with the twin values of excellence and merit. Speaking at his inauguration, Kerr noted, and I quote, the university's responsibility is not met in full by the education of successive student bodies or by the provision of myriad public services. These constitute the core of its activity, but do not exhaust its obligation. The university plays its highest role and meets its most profound obligation by its contributions to the moral and intellectual life. Six years later, as president of the system and on the threshold of great expansion and rapid growth, he reaffirmed that as the university prepared for a future that in his words could create a golden age for mankind, it was of paramount importance that an intellectual and moral vision guide the great values that knowledge should be made to serve. By 1963, Kerr was confident enough to announce, and I quote, that the American university is undergoing its second great transformation that will cover roughly the quarter century after World War II. The university is called upon to educate previously unimagined numbers of students to respond to the expanding claims of national service to adapt to and rechannel new intellectual currents. By the end of this period, there will be a truly American university, an institution unique in world history, an institution not looking to other models, but serving itself as a model for universities in other parts of the globe. He was prophetic, and he played a foundational role in the creation of the success of this global model. And yet, Reflecting on these same questions some 40 years later, long after he'd been challenged by the free speech movement and then brought down by the collision of political forces in the California of the 1960s, Kerr acknowledged that his was still less than a golden age. He worried that the master plan survived only in diminished degree, undermined both by the tensions between teaching at the undergraduate level and advanced research and by the unprecedented competition for public resources. And yet, only 13 years into the new millennium, I confess to a certain nostalgia for the very time that alarmed him most. <laughs> Kerr cogently identified issues and challenges that have only intensified and in dramatic ways over the intervening years. It's hard to know what he would have said if he knew that in the year I assumed the chancellorship, only 12% of our budget comes from the state, down from 35% in 2001 in which he wrote those words. However, if we are to follow the real spirit of Clark Kerr, I believe that we must look to the future and insist on his relentlessly utopian vision that must continue to guide us as we chart our way through a growing host of difficulties and obstacles. Even as I speak today about my ideas for re-envisioning the great American university, I readily confess to my own streak of utopianism, acknowledging that utopian ideals are about the values that we profess and act upon, 
rather than the realities of institutional life that will always and inevitably be flawed, ever subject to our recognition of the incompleteness of our mission, our need to do better and achieve more. So my first pillar that I'll talk about this afternoon is undergraduate education and the liberal arts and sciences. The belief that the liberal arts and sciences should be central to undergraduate education rests on a distinctively American idea. It was rooted originally in classical and religious education. But for many years since, this belief has taken on the form of, of a commitment that our students engage fundamental human debates, dilemmas, and discourses, both as the means to develop critical thinking and for the purpose of becoming active citizens of our world. Today, there are many who proclaim the irrelevance, waste, and even danger of this kind of education, even as there are those who contest the importance of citizenship and even the idea, the very idea, of a public sphere. Many doubt that it might still be important for our students to wrestle with Aristotle on the good life, Confucius on public ethics, Locke and Marx on the origins of property, Jefferson and de Tocqueville on the nature of democracy, Darwin on human evolution, Du Bois on the legacy of slavery, Gandhi on the humiliations of empire, or de Beauvoir on the making of women. I, however, am still inspired by the liberal arts education I had, as an example of which the magic of an early class I took at Wesleyan on free will and necessity, in which I participated in a semester-long debate between theories of freedom and human agency on the one hand, and experimental evidence from biological and social psychology on the other that I confess confounds me to the present day. I believe that the literary and artistic imagination is more important than ever for us to cultivate, especially especially given our growing reliance on science and technology, not just to design our relationship to the lived environment, but also to reshape and redefine our relationships with the economy, with society, and indeed even with our physical bodies. And I believe that all of our students need to engage with past and present debates and discoveries in the sciences in order to engage directly with the most pressing issues of our day. In this age, of economic turmoil, government debt, and growing disenchantment with many of our public institutions, however, the education we offer has come under greater scrutiny than ever before. Given the rapidly escalating cost of higher education, this scrutiny is not only warranted, it is necessary. The arguments I've just made depend upon ensuring that all of our youth have proper access to a university education and genuine assurances about the actual affordability of college. When st students graduate with debt, with uncertain job prospects, it is small wonder that we're being asked to measure the literal value of a degree in the form of jobs and earnings. The liberal arts now often seem to be a luxury that only the elite can afford, and even they seem increasingly skeptical. The challenge before us, however, is as great as the future of democracy itself. The character of the public sphere, the extent of our imagination, and the nature of our vision. These, in truth, are not luxuries, but the fundamental conditions for a good life, a just society, a productive economy, a functioning political system, and a sustainable planet. We will not be able to generate sufficient resources to preserve our university, to secure more funding from the state, and greater support from our alumni and our donors, and let me be clear, we need to do both, if we do not find ways to defend the importance of both our public and our intellectual mission. We must not be preoccupied by internal quarrels, and we must not lose our resolve. We must find new ways to tell our story, while exemplifying the extent to which a public institution still can inspire trust and commitment. And in my view, we must place undergraduate education at the center of our research, university, and aspirations. 
we will, we will do even more to provide extraordinary opportunities for our undergraduates. We should not tire of celebrating the fact that we educate as many Pell Grant recipients here at the University of California at Berkeley as the entire Ivy League combined. And yet, and yet, we have to support and expand this diversity through more financial aid, better advising, more capacious student services. We must also pay constant and comprehensive attention to our undergraduate curriculum, the centerpiece of the liberal education we offer that is one of the most important charges of the faculty and the university. We need to find ways to connect students more vitally, not just to the intellectual opportunities on the campus, but to the faculty, to the graduate students who serve as mentors as well as teachers, and to their community. We must build on the enormous success of our freshman and sophomore seminars, our big ideas courses, innovative new initiatives such as the Berkeley Connect program, our extraordinary majors, the SMART program that involves graduate students in teaching and learning. We need to ensure that all of our students have opportunities to connect to research work in laboratories as well as libraries, in projects ranging across the full spectrum of research programs, including moving out into our local communities, engaging them not just to do research, but to do community service. And we must ensure that we afford our students opportunities to research and study abroad, just as I did many years ago. The second pillar I'll talk about is the global university. UC Berkeley, for years, has been global in its interests, its connections, its teaching, and its scholarship. Its first endowed chair, gifted in 1872 by Edward Tompkins, was the Agassiz Professorship of Oriental Languages and Literatures. Berkeley was one of the first universities to foster research and teaching about South Asia of the sort that made possible the education I received and the scholarly life I have pursued. We have unique resources for global study, but we are also in a unique position to lead the way towards creating a new kind of global ecosystem for a more extensive engagement with the world. And this has never been more important. The level and pace of global interconnectedness has never been greater. Beyond the continuing need for global literacy, we need to educate our students in ways that prepare them to pursue careers and live lives that will inevitably reflect the growing significance and reach of globalization. Now, Berkeley, with its combination of global knowledge, its strong commitment to change the world for the better, has an unmatched ability to make a real difference on a global scale. We have an interdisciplinary philosophy that provides a potent base for engaging the most complex global issues, poverty, inequality, climate change, public health, sustainable forms of energy, the understanding of cultural and political conflicts. These challenges recognize no national borders and can only be addressed by approaches that accept no academic boundaries. While the US questions both the public and private good represented by education and research at the highest levels, Many others in the world, in Asia and across the globe, are seeking partnerships with U.S. universities to establish their own educational infrastructure in ways directly modeled on our success. We must neither give up what others have recognized as our signature strength, nor fail to appreciate the extraordinary opportunities of the present moment. And at Berkeley, we are well positioned for a new globally-based collaboration and set of initiatives from our joint ventures in Shanghai and Singapore to the Pakistan Initiative, our work in the Blum Center for Developing Economies, to mention just a few. But here, too, we can do more. Through the establishment of what I think of as a set of consular offices in key regions of the globe where we can connect our faculty, our students, our alumni, and our staff with new kinds of global activities, networks, projects, and undertakings. We'll have to discuss and debate a large range of issues central to our engagement with the global and the enhancement of our global footprint in the 21st century. 
including the challenges of different national environments for issues around academic freedom, as well as political and human rights, the need to rethink the academic and disciplinary structures that organize the university, the role of online education, the very nature of scholarly collaboration, authorship, and institutional affiliation, and our very relationship to, perhaps, to the state of California. We will address the greater good, however, on a global scale for a global public, because we can. The third pillar I'd like to talk about is innovation in basic and applied research across the disciplines. Now, Berkeley, of course, has been one of the most innovative centers for research in both the basic and the applied sciences since its early establishment. We established the first seismology station in the Western Hemisphere. We developed the flu vaccine in nuclear medicine, crystallized the virus for polio, founded the first biotech firm, assembled the world's largest telescope, found new planets, and determined, yes, Saul, that the universe is accelerating. <laughs> Berkeley faculty have played major roles in the development of large collaborations in civil engineering around the construction of bridges, dams, and buildings, in physics through the work of Ernest Lawrence in developing the first cyclotron, and in fields as various as paleontology, linguistics, molecular evolution, and genomics. Our ongoing work in areas such as computing, nanoscience, energy biosciences, and big data continues this tradition of leadership and innovation that bridges theoretical and applied fields as well as multiple disciplines. And we are about to launch an ambitious new, or new agenda for neuroscience as well. Our history of innovation is equally vested in the humanities and social sciences. For example, in the work that was done here to develop the field of new historicism and that was first disseminated through the journal Representations. Through path-breaking accomplishments in fields ranging from medical anthropology to behavioral economics, in areas spanning the performing arts and the applied social sciences. And yet, we are confronting not just the dire effects of diminished support for research from the state, but the increasing pressure on federal and even foundation budgets, especially, especially for basic research. While we know that basic research often leads to unexpected findings for medical and technical advances, and that applied research in turn leads to new conceptual understandings, we also know that the current funding environment may ironically deter the very innovation, the kind of risk-taking and collaboration that have been so much a feature of this institution. I will find new ways to support and to encourage continued innovation across fields and areas of research, to ensure that the research environment bridges different units of the university, not just within the extraordinary range of work in the basic sciences, but from engineering to the arts, from natural resources to the information sciences, and from business to social welfare. Our graduate students are critical to this research mission, and I will work to find better support for them as well. And while developing and promoting and further supporting our graduate programs, we at the same time will ensure that all of our undergraduates, whatever their programs and whatever their majors, should build research into their education so that the value of studying in a research university is made real and the skill of advanced research becomes one of the signal ingredients of all the degrees we offer. Now, I just outlined some of the most significant challenges before us as we seek to prepare our university for the bold new world ahead of us. Over the course of the next few months, I'll be announcing and launching a set of university-wide initiatives designed to advance these agendas on the Berkeley campus and beyond. I will chair a task force on undergraduate education that will focus attention on three areas, how we can support and expand our considerable achievements in diversity, how we can evaluate and strengthen our curriculum, and how we can find ways to connect and support student life more comprehensively. I'll be working with our extended campus community to determine the steps we can take to design a new global plan for our university. And in working with our community to promote and sponsor our innovation and research, I will pay special attention 
to the role and the opportunities of the new Richmond Bay campus in providing the space for new developments, new partnerships, and new opportunities. The three pillars I've just described will by no means exhaust the full range of initiatives I hope to undertake. I will, for example, be convening another university-wide committee to establish a vision for the arts at Berkeley to ensure that all of our students gain a grounded experience of the arts during their time here. Additionally, we know that we are at the dawn of a new era in the use of technology for educational purposes. I will bring together the extraordinary resources and initiatives already on campus to engage our community in a consideration of what is possible and what is desirable, the opportunities and the risks of new technologies, the issues that arise around both how the faculty teach and how students learn. And finally, in an age when the challenges to affirmative action mount and the political commitment to ensuring diversity is being whittled away by referenda and court challenges, I will engage our campus in finding new ways to reflect the rich ethnic, racial, cultural, and socioeconomic tapestry of our state. African American, African American, Native American, Latino, documented and undocumented alike. And I will seek to do so at every level and every part of our university. We have just celebrated our 22nd Nobel Prize awarded to cell biologist Randy Sheckman, our first faculty member. Randy. Even though he's the 22nd member of our faculty to win the award, he's the first faculty member to win the prize in physiology and medicine. His work exemplifies the importance of basic research while showing that such research can end up having life-saving applications. Randy recently announced that he is donating his Nobel Award money to found a chair in cancer research here at the University of California, Berkeley. He is one of so many citizens of this extraordinary university who demonstrate over and over again the reality of their commitment to a greater good. Also sitting with us this afternoon are Berkeley students, staff members, and alums who exemplify the ethos of this campus. Rosemary Hua, an undergraduate student, set up a partnership with colleagues in Ghana to establish a volunteer program in which Berkeley students go to Ghana to build schools. Faramin Ray Gadas, a PhD student, won a Big, Adi Big Ideas Award for work he'd been doing to create ultraviolet water treatments for households in Mexico. Lorena Valdez was a first-generation college student here, her parents from Mexico. After graduation, she stayed to give back. And today, Lorena directs the program she built our pioneering transfer student services program that, that assists and supports the thousands of transfer students on the Berkeley campus. And, all three of these uh, uh, wonderful colleagues are sitting here to the right, so let us recognize them all, please. Yes. There's one other person I want to recognize who's not here today. This is Meng So, another Berkeley alum, who returned to campus to be the first coordinator of our undocumented student program. He fled the Khmer Rouge genocide, and spent his first 12 years in this country without legal status. His program now has become a national model, and he is today at the University of Michigan sharing his work there on undocumented students. So.
But there are countless others who have grappled with intellectual and moral challenges in Berkeley's classrooms only to leave here with a commitment to change the world. And that is why I am unreservedly enthusiastic about our future. That is why I believe that now is the time for us not just to preserve and protect Berkeley's past record of accomplishment, but also to work together to do more. The brilliant and accomplished scholars on our faculty, our exceptionally talented and committed students, our deeply loyal and hardworking staff, and our proud and distinguished alumni are a global testament to the spirit and vision of the people of California who imagined the utopian ideal of a great public university. I invite you now to join me in a collective effort to imagine new futures for this great institution. The stakes for us are as high as our aspirations. To preserve democracy, to maintain the ideal of the public good, to elevate and sustain the intellectual and moral compass that must guide our future, these are our utopian goals. Together, here, now, we are all utopians. Fiat Lux. Thank you. Our new chancellor. Everybody, we are now very pleased as we come to the conclusion of the program to welcome the UC Men's Octet, the California Golden Overtones and Decadence, who will come together to sing the traditional Hail to California. Following their performance, we would like to ask all guests to please remain seated while the academic procession departs to the main lobby. Following that, you may also join us in the lobby for a post-ceremony reception. Thank you again so much, Chancellor Dirks. Congratulations and go Bears!
Chancellor Dirks and Professor Bockley again. Congratulations, the new first couple of the University of California, Berkeley. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude our program. Again, please allow the academic procession to the lobby first, and then please join us for a reception in the lobby. Thank you again for celebrating this historic milestone at Berkeley today. And once again, go Bears!